Hey gamers, I'm Jessica with Guiding Bolt Gaming, and today I'm excited to jump in the lore behind the fascinating race of Modrons. Modrons are an immortal race known for their zealous adherence to the principles of law and order. Within the Great Wheel cosmology, they live amongst the outer planes on the plane known as the Clockwork Nirvana of Mechanus, sometimes simply known as Nirvana or Mechanus. Mechanus is the plane of lawful neutral where everything is in perfect order, equal parts light and dark, heat and cold, and equal measures of the four elements. Within Mechanus, the Modron race mostly presides within the realm of Regulus, a giant city that consists of 64 interconnecting cogs. Outside of the realm, they are extremely rare, but can be found wherever their missions lead them. Primus, the one in the prime, is the immortal ruler of Mechanus and the Modrons. At the center of the largest cog in Mechanus, he rises from the great energy pool, which is the source that links and gives life to all Modrons. Primus has absolute power over all Modrons who obey and carry out his plans. He is connected to every single Modron and experiences everything they experience. Primus is totally immune, immune to all magic and communicates with the Modrons on Mechanus through telecommunication. Although godlike, he can be killed, and if this occurs, the next highest ranking Modron is promoted to his position and becomes the new Primus. Modron society is built upon caste and hierarchy and is extremely orderly. Modrons do not believe in chaos. To them, chaos is nothing more than order too complex for mortals to understand. They're convinced that with proper study and analysis, they can unlock the hidden logic within chaos. They're devoted to their overall race over the individual, and they come across as frustratingly bureaucratic and unemotional to other races. While they seem remarkably similar in demeanor to one another, they are not pure automatons, and in fact, have unique personalities with their own individual collections of character traits. But due to immense rigidity in Modron society, these subtle trait differences are often overshadowed, especially given that nearly every Modron of the same cast looks identical to all the others. Modrons are genderless constructs. They look like a cross between clockwork creatures and living flesh. Their bodies are shaped like geometric objects with spindly arms and legs. They have no visible noses or ears, but can smell and hear normally through other small orifices hidden on their various faces. Each Modron cast has a specific shape associated with it. The higher the rank, the more complex the shape. The castes and hierarchy of Modrons keep their society running smoothly. In fact, they define the Modron's physiology, their abilities and duties, and advancements within their society. There are 14 types of Modrons, divided into two major categories, the base Modrons and the hierarchs. The base Modrons consist of the monodrones, duodrones, tridrones, quadrones, and pentadrones. They vastly outnumber the higher caste Modrons and serve as the general laborers and frontline soldiers of their society. The Hierarch Modrons are responsible for directing Modron society and keeping the base Modrons working effectively. Less is known about the Hierarchs compared to the base Modrons, but their casts include the Decatons, Nonatons, Octons, Septons, Hextons, Quintons, Quartons, Tertians, and Secundi. There are only 100 Decatons in existence. The Secundus, who are second in power to Primus, rival solar and pit fiends in power, and there are only four of them in existence. Because more information is known about them, let's dive into the Modron-based casts. At the bottom of Modron society are the Monodrones. This cast comprises more than half of the Modron population. These guys are spears with a single eye and mouth, and they stand two feet tall and weigh 40 pounds. One third of the monodrones are known as messenger monodrones, and they have small mechanical wings in place of their arms. Messenger monodrones are used frequently to communicate with modrons traveling throughout the plains, especially on the material plane. They also are quite useful as familiars. 
Monodrones are the base laborers of their society. Their projects are broken up into as many small tasks as possible. Within a battalion, each monodrone undertakes a very simple task which together have a larger, more complex benefit for the race. Monodrones are notorious for performing a task until told to stop. For example, they will continue to mine long after a mineral is gone, or will continue to kill each other on a battlefield, even killing each other if no enemy is present anymore. Individually, monodrones are not very effective in combat. When encountering any form of aggression, even verbal, they flee and report it to other Modron in the vicinity unless they outnumber their opponents by at least three to one. In sufficient numbers, however, monodrones can be devastating. Even with their low intelligence, they still naturally coordinate their attacks surrounding those who appear to be the greatest threats first and concentrating their attacks. If they order attack, to attack, they will fight until the death without wavering. Messenger monodrome never fight unless they face no other option or order to. The next class above monodromes are the duodromes. The duodromes are flat and rectangular in shape with a single face and a pair of eyes. They also possess small wings and are three feet tall and weigh 120 pounds. The role of the duodromes is to supervise the monodromes when necessary. They themselves can perform either somewhat more complex tasks that require moderate decision making or perform two very separate simple tasks. This often includes an ongoing task like watching a location for non-modron arrivals and a specific short-term mission such as building a building. They are remarkably strong for their size and are given manual labor tasks that involve the need for greater strength than the monodrome possess. Duodrones are not afraid of combat and fight to defend themselves even without orders. If vastly outnumbered, one usually leaves to warn others while the rest stand and fight even as a delaying tactic. They have no fear of death since they are dimly aware that they will return to the energy pool and be reborn. As with all modrons, duodrones naturally coordinate their attacks, but are more apt to split up in an attempt to weaken as many foes as possible. They often start off with their surge of strength in order to make themselves appear even stronger than they already are, in hopes of either finishing their opponent quickly or scaring them off. The middle tier of the base cast consists of the tridomes. The tridomes are shaped like inverted pyramids with a flat triangular top and spindly appendages sprouting below. On each of their faces of the pyramid body, the tridome has a single eye and a single mouth. They are four feet tall and weigh 350 pounds. One job of the tridomes is to supervise the duodromes and monodromes. They can handle even greater tasks than the cast below them and can coordinate limited resource management and decision making. Given their excellent climbing ability and all-around vision capability, they are commonly used as scouts and guards on the borders of Regulus. The Tridrone's ability to throw numerous javelins and wield multiple weapons make them a fighting force just as deadly as a massive force of spear-wielding monodromes, but with far fewer numbers. Tridrones focus on movement and using the terrain to tactical advantages. In caverns and inside buildings, they often climb the walls and drop down on their enemies. Furthermore, they typically begin combat by throwing their javelins and then charging into melee. Since they spend much of their time exploring or working on the edges of Mechanus's gears, tridones tend to be more solitary than the other modrons. Due to this, they are more apt to fight as individuals rather than as coordinated whole. Given their preference for continually darting about during combat and their near identical appearance, a group of attacking tridrones can be very difficult to fight effectively. Above the tridrones are the quadrones. Quadrones are the archetypal modron since they are the race's primary contact with non-modrons due to their ability in handling the complexity of social tasks and having flexibility in decision making. Quadrones are cubes with only two legs and either four arms or two arms and two wings. 
They have a pair of eyes and a mouth on every face of the cube, even the base and top. Their bodies are six feet tall and their blockish forms weigh 500 pounds. Quadrones are even more capable in battle than tridrones and are more than a match for most human warriors. On top of their individual abilities, their coordination makes them an unflinchingly organized fighting force and capable commanders of any lesser modron. Quadrones are the lowest caste to have significant intelligence and the capability to strategize and plan. With this, they can be incredibly effective, balancing ranged attacks with their two longbows against deadly assaults with their short swords. In groups of mixed casts, they are aware of the capabilities of lesser casts and order them to attack according to their strengths. Furthermore, given that they interact with outsiders more than the other castes, quadrones are often aware of the strengths and weaknesses of other races and don't hesitate to use every advantage possible to crush their opponents. They fight furiously, not out of brutality or desire for glory, but from pure efficiency. Orders must be obeyed. The highest caste and most powerful of the base modron are the pentadrones. The pentadrones are shaped like a five-pointed starfish with thick appendages drooping down from a central high point. Each appendage possesses a single eye and mouth. In the center of the appendages stands five legs and a spherical gas emitter. They lack arms but can use their appendages for grasping objects. They stand just over seven feet tall and weigh 500 pounds. The pentadrone act as intermediaries between the hierarch and the base modron. Their combat prowess outstrips any other base modron, but they're quite rare in modron armies. This is because, second to acting as intermediary to the hierarchs, pentadrones typically focus their martial abilities on other modron. Squads of pentadrones are the primary means of hunting down and executing rogue modron. Individuals and small groups that infiltrate regulus to cause trouble also quickly find themselves on the receiving end of the pentadrone paralysis gas attack. At the most advanced of the base modron, pentadrones have a complex set of responsibilities. They must interpret and pass down orders from the hierarchs to the hundreds of thousands of quadrones and then on to the millions of other lesser modron. And they must hunt down and destroy their own kind when they turn rogue. To manage these duties, pentadrones are introspective and deeply analytical. They attempt to study every obstacle carefully for all possible solutions. Once they decide on a plan, they immediately launch their assault. The dramatic shift from quiet observation to sudden attack can be quite effective in catching opponents off guard. Unlike the monodrones and duodrones, and to a lesser extent the tridrones and quadrones, Pentadrones constantly reevaluate their plans and can abandon a plan already in action to pursue another. Again, these shifts are typically dramatic and sudden. Knowing their importance among the base modron, pentadrones have a stronger survival instinct than the other modron and withdraw from fights to save themselves. As with so many aspects of modron life, this can easily be interpreted as an emotional act but in reality, it's merely the most logical course of action in many circumstances. If the situation dictates that staying in a fight, even at the cost of its own life, would have the greatest outcome for the other modron, then a pentadrone fights with as much determination as the single-minded monodrone. They fully understand the significance of the energy pool and know that their destruction of the current form is only temporary. All Modrons operate according to their caste and carry out commands with total obedience, utmost efficiency, and an absence of morality or ego. The majority of base Modrons can only comprehend Modron of one caste above or below them. All other castes are incomprehensible beings of order, much as many mortals view powerful celestials and fiends. Consequently, Tridrone can never directly communicate with the Monodrone, and a pentadrone can never give direct order to a tridrone or lower. This causes communication up and down the cast to be a long and inordinately complex process. Other races, such as the Formians, have believed this to be a weakness in Modron and have tried to exploit it. Unfortunately, they've found that with the Modron's ability to break complex activities, 
into highly coordinated simple tasks, the Modron can mount at a frighteningly effective, defensive, extremely efficiently. With two simple commands of kill all four means on site and tell all lower caste Modron these two orders, Modrons appear to defend against invaders at an exponential rate. Hierarch Modrons can communicate telepathically with any intelligent being, including Modron of any caste. This can lead to misinterpretation on the part of lower caste Modron trying to comprehend the edicts of such an ordered being, which in turn has a chance of creating rogue Modron. Therefore, this form of communication is used rarely and with great care. When a Modron is destroyed, including Primus himself, a Modron of the next lower caste is promoted to fill that void. The promoted Modron undergoes a physical and mental transformation, after which it takes on all the characteristics of the Modron it's being promoted to take over for. The promotion of a Modron of the next lower caste fills the new void and on down through the castes. At the end of the chain, a new Modron is burst from the energy pool, completing the process. The destroyed Modrons send their life energy back to the energy pool, and each advancing Modron subtly draws upon the pool to power its transformation. All Modron are immune to mind effects, emotion effects, and magic that draws upon the positive energy or the negative energy planes. They are resistant to cold, fire, and acid. Modron rarely carry coins or goods. Outside Regulus, Modrons are equipped with the standard level of items, and within Regulus, Modrons only carry what items are necessary for their duty. Consequently, unless placed specifically on guard duty or hunting for rogue Modron, a Modron is not armed. Aside from their extreme obedience and order, the Modron are also known for the Rogue March. The Rogue March is an event that takes place every 17 cycles, a cycle being the 17-year period of time it takes for the largest gear and mechanist to make one rotation. For a math assist, the march happens once every 289 years. The Rogue March is, the Modron, is when the Modrons trek forth from Regulus in a mass procession in which they travel the entirety of the outer planes on the Great Wheel. Very few know the truth behind the Rogue March, and those that do guard the secret very close for fear of retribution. Some theorize it serves Primus as a means of gathering information on the current state of the planes and their inhabitants, and to calibrate the gears of Mechanus accordingly. Others say Modron's March to bestow a sense of order, even short, for a short period of time, though with the amount of chaos created in their wake, no one thinks this very successful. Andril, a now deceased wizard who studied the Modron, believed that by going forth in such extreme environments, their purpose is to be destroyed and thereby respawn as many Modrons as possible. This massive renewing of the Modron race causes the newly promoted and spawned Modrons to be stronger and even more durable than previous generations. No matter the reason for the march, a vast number of them are destroyed during this trek. Sometimes commands are misinterpreted even among the Modron, and contradictory instructions can pass through two separate chains of command to the same Modron. Although exceedingly rare, this conflict can easily lead to a Modron going insane, abandoning its duties and turning rogue. Other contradictions in experience, such as on the chaotic plane of limbo, can also cause a Modron to go rogue. Even more rarely, the seeds of disobedience occur naturally within the Modron so that it grows discontent with service to the bureaucracy, even without an outside contradiction confronting it. Sages theorize that perhaps Primus himself plants these seeds in order to gain a further understanding of the universe. Whatever the cause, rogues are hunted down and destroyed without mercy by their fellow Modron. Very quickly after someone discovers a rogue Modron, all Modron with the Regulus know this and recognize the character as rogue on sight. Pentadrone then hunt them down and attempt to assassinate them. Even with how reviled rogue Modron are, a rare process exists for Modrons to be exiled. This occurs mostly in Modrons of quadrone level and above, since they have the intellect to sometimes realize their own rogue nature and begin the petition process before they are discovered and destroyed. 
Even among the rare few who begin this process, a very select number are approved for exile. These exiles undergo a physical transformation within the Modron Cathedral and the center of Regulus, which breaks their bond to the energy pool. This transforms them into a creature that resembles a quadro. The sages who believe that Primus often plants the seeds of conflict within some of the Modron also theorize that Primus himself approves these Modron for exile in order for them to explore the plains unhindered by the rigidity of Modron duties. Tridrone and higher castes can be playable just like any other monstrous race. Rogue Modron free players from alignment and class restrictions and from having to follow the orders of the Modron hierarchy. The drawback is that the rest of the Modron race wants to destroy them. For campaigns set on the material plane, far from the clockwork nirvana of Mechanus, this becomes more viable. With the shakeups currently happening among the Modron race, Few pentadrones are assigned to destroy rogue-based modrons that have fled the outer planes. The rogue modron personalities tend toward chaotic far more than lawful. Turning their backs on the modron race, they often seek to prove their independence, even when it's not the wisest course of action. Rogue modrons tend to either take command or they simply ignore other authority figures. They might appear overly emotional, but the close observation shows that they are mostly going through the motions in an attempt to appear more emotional than they really are. Exile Modrons go a step further and are particularly suitable for player characters. With their bond to the energy pool broken, they gain the living construct subtype. Essentially, Exile Modrons begin their lives again with few faint memories of their past life. True Modrons, and even many rogue Modron, view the exiles as they view any other non-Modron outsider. They're no better or worse than humans or tieflings. They are not from any caste and can have a range of personalities, can be from any class, and can be any alignment but tend toward lawful alignment and still prefer to know the hierarchy of command within any group they join. They differ from true Modron, however, in that they can be far more flexible and adapt to various new situations without resorting to a set of standard procedures. Still being Modron, though, they often have difficulty comprehending logical mortal ideas like art, passion, and honor. Exiled Modrons are always exactly five and a half feet tall and weigh 400 pounds. Wow! I don't know about you guys, but I think Modron Society is quite the curious attraction. If you're interested in D&D lore, let me know down below in the comments and feel free to recommend a topic for our next lore video. Give this video a like if you find Modron fascinating like me, and we'll see you guys back here next week for more great D&D content.